My name is Sebastian Kofurst. I work at a company called Sandstorm. It's actually that one um, on top here. Um, we do web applications, um, a lot with NEOS, but also with other technologies. And I'm just extremely glad to be part of NEOS and to be able to present today. So Christian, over to you, I would say. Right. I'm uh, Christian Miller. And um, I work at a company called Flow Native. Um, that also appears over there at some point. And um, yeah, we work uh, together with, with you basically um, to provide custom features for, for Neos and Flow and also um, to uh, help you with your projects basically. And yeah, we are both part of the core team since many years. And so we would like to introduce you to some hacking into the deep stuff. Right. So um, you might wonder why this is actually important. You know, I mean, uh, Stefan in his presentation said we should focus on the user, and actually he is so extremely right on that. So we really want to focus on the user. But you know, what uh, the things which look really, really simple to the outside, they may become really, really complex to the inside as well. So that means we need a way to work with NEOS in a good way to adapt NEOS to your use cases, to the specific use cases of your customers. And in order to, that, to make that possible, we need to be able to extend NEOS in general. And this is what this talk will be about, um, extending NEOS. So if you look at NEOS, um, you see, after you log in, you basically see the website as it is. I guess many of you know that. Um, you can just type in right away and start editing your content. And on the left, you see this navigate component where you can basically have a page tree kind of thing. If you select something, then you can uh, change the details on the right side in what we call the inspector. And that's basically it. Pretty simple, actually. And if we, if we think about extending NEOS, actually, uh, there are two ways of extending uh, we, uh, we see as important. The first one is what we call planned extensibility. That means we as the NEOS team, we know that extending a certain part is really important to your business um, and we want to make that possible. So that is like a, a certain way of, of putting functionality in a defined way in NEOS. It's pretty much like if you take a Raspberry Pi um, and you just plug something in there, you know, that is pretty much like, like um, it should work. Um, just plug it in the, in the plugs there, and then it works out. And that's great, because you, know, you get support by the NEOS team if you do that. Uh, things won't break when you upgrade, for instance. Um, so if there's a planned extension point, that is great, and you should always use that. But from time to time, there are also um, points in time where this doesn't work out, you know, uh, where everything pretty much works as you expect, but something in NEOS or in Flow doesn't work the way you want it to be. And then you check the code of Flow and NEOS, and you find this small little detail, this if condition, which is just wrong for your use case, and you want to patch that. And of course, patching the core is pretty bad. That's why we are thinking also about a way to do unplanned extensibility. So that means um, you can just change anything you want, basically, um, without us even knowing or noticing. Of course, that means that if you upgrade, you really need to take care of these parts, so because things might break in that area, but still, um, it is really defined where these things might break and what you have to look at when you upgrade, so that is still pretty good. So that's like uh, soldering something on the, on the Raspberry Pi, for instance, if you take that analogy. And because that's so important, um, we, will, um, we will use these two pictograms to, to, to distinguish the different ways of extending NEOS. Um, so that is pretty much what you will see on the next um, slides as well. So as you know, NEOS is backed by Flow. So the first part will be about um, showing how the foundation of NEOS, how Flow can be extended. And Christian will take over that part. Exactly. So we are starting at the base of all of this, of Flow and NEOS, which is basically the Flow framework. And um, just to get the rough overview, you have the content repository on top that will come later. And then you have the rendering engine, TypeScript, 
um, parts of fluid, basically. Then you have the media management, which can also be extended, of course. And then you have the user interface on top, which is basically the client side. Um, and custom packages uh, fill the gap uh, to add any functionality you need. So um, I will start with really the low-level stuff. And we will go through the MVC, Fluid stuff, um, HTTP, and um, the object management, dependency injection, the aspect-oriented programming. That will be the first part for me now. So let's concentrate on that. First, of course, you can have custom packages. I mean, that's the obvious way to extend Flow and Neos. Um, Everyone should do that. If you can, always use a custom package. It's the best way to encapsulate your extension, your changes, your modifications, your additional functionality. Um, you can reuse it in any project you have. And obviously, it is up to you to keep it up to date with our core. But basically, nothing should break if you create a custom package. So that's your main extension point, basically, in Flow and Eos. Um, the most important thing you have to watch for is if you extend stuff from us, um, like settings or you override stuff, you always should watch out for the loading order of your custom package, uh, because obviously um, your packages should be loaded after the package you want to extend uh, to make sure your settings override our settings, um, stuff like that. That's really the main important part. But then um, custom packages can bring, bring you a long way uh, towards doing your custom stuff in there. But obviously, there are points where a custom package alone just doesn't cut it. So um, we will start with the MVC layer of uh, Flow. And the first obvious extension point is a custom view helper. That's a totally planned extension point. Um, you can put that in your own package. Um, the idea is that you can add whatever functionality you need to your views. Uh, view helper is used in your templates. And um, whatever functionality you want to have in a template, you can add with a custom view helper. It's really very easy. We have just a few lines of code on all the slides that, that are evolving code, just to show you the really two or three important lines that, that will help you to get started with this. So custom view helpers, you basically extend the abstract tag-based view helper or abstract view helper, and there you go from there. It's really easy. You implement your custom functionality, and off you go uh, having stuff in your templates. So. Um, really easy. Um, then you have Views YAML. That's also fluid, basically, um, but also MVC part, because you can not only use Views YAML for fluid templates, but also for any other view that you might implement um, for Flow. And uh, the Views YAML is kind of an unplanned extension, because uh, we cannot know what kind of options you set. Um, still, it is, um, it is documented, and um, all the views have defined set of options. So it's halfway in between planned and unplanned. Um, but obviously, if we change something in the view, uh, your views YAML, your options might not work anymore. So it's kind of unplanned. You should at least watch it uh, if you upgrade uh, and you have a complex view YAML. The idea here is that with views YAML, you can configure options for the view from the outside, so even views that you have no control over. So let's say you have a third-party package, a block package, whatever, that brings its own templates. Um, this is all wonderful. You like the functionality of the package. But in fact, the templates are not fitting the way you want to have your markup structured, so you need to change the templates. Um, and um, I mean, you could override the, the controller and make your own thing, but that's a lot of hassle. And basically, you just want to exchange the templates. And uh, with the views YAML, you have a very, very refined ways to define at which points in your application or in Neos you want to change parts of your view. So you can change the, uh, the path where, where templates are loaded from. You can change the path where layouts are loaded from, where partials are loaded from. And you can even have uh, overlays, basically. So let's say you have this kind of package that has 10 templates, and you, you just dislike one of the 10 templates. Um, you can not only just set one template path, that would mean you have to copy all 10 templates to the new template path, but you can have fallback path. So you can say, OK, this one template, I copy it over and have that as my first 
template loading path and then the original template loading path as secondary loading path and everything will work. So it's really easy to extend um, other packages with this and change the, uh, the display and the views. Very important extension point, especially in Neos, because the more packages you have, um, the more you want to change the templates and adapt them to the custom project you have. So, um, basically a simple example, it's a YAML configuration. Um, you, you define in, in which requests you want to change something and then you set the options that you want to change. So really easy. Then you have type converters. Type converters are used also in the MVC stack to transform the values that you get from your request. Those are basic uh, get and post variables, so it's all simple values. And you usually want to have some more complex values in your controller, like an image entity or a node or whatever. And the type converters take care of converting a defined set of information into something more complex, like an object. And um, we have a, a very big set of type converters by now that you can use that should cover all the basic things that you need to convert, um, like exactly image objects and nodes and all that. We, we are prepared for that. But if you need custom transformations, because um, you have a third party service that delivers data in a special way and you need to transform that to something in Flow or Neos, you can write a custom type converter that uh, takes this data and knows the logic to convert that into the object you want. So you don't need to do that in your controller, but you have it encapsulated in a specific place, uh, which helps you to reuse that, this logic. And this is called the type converter. Um, it's a PHP, also a plant extension point, very easy to do, basically. You can just write a type converter. It will be registered. It's really a good way to do this kind of connection to third-party service where you don't have control over the data that is coming into your application. So then we go over to the HTTP stack, which is even a bit lower than the MVC and Fluid part. And here we have the HTTP components since a few versions of Flow now. And we provide a basic set of HTTP components that do everything that you need to do in a typical application that takes care of the routing and the dispatching to the controller. It's really low level. And if you need to do something on this le low level um, in your application, you want to do something even before the controller, maybe even before the routing, um, you can write a custom HTTP component and configure it to be part of our HTTP components uh, chain. And uh, it will be used, and it's, um, you, can, you can transport information from that. Um, also, a very easy way to wrap applications into something. Uh, an example would be if you want to have a full application uh, caching layer on request level, you could do that with HTTP components uh, if you really want to. Um, there are many ways to use them, uh, but it's already really low level, so you should, you should know what you're doing, but still it's a planned extension point that we provide for you. Um, you basically create the PHP component and then configure it in YAML. That's the configuration you see there, and it's a planned extension point. Um, also, the flow settings um, provide you with a lot of options that you should check at some point. Um, you can configure a lot in Flow via settings YAML. Uh, the configuration we provide uh, with Flow are same defaults that we think make sense for most applications, but if you feel you need to change something, you can do this. And um, you can change exception handlers, for example. If you are, don't like the way exemptions are handled, um, you can write custom exception handlers and um, add them to the settings um, separately for production and development environments. So um, if you want to show a nicer error message for uh, production environments, if an exception happens, you can do that with a custom exception handler. Um, or you can lock exceptions to some other place, whatever you want. Exception handlers are the place to go. You can have custom loggers. Um, we provide a few logger backends, but if you need something special and you want to log into Logstash or whatever, uh, you can implement your custom logging backend. Um, again, configure it via settings and lock um, the, the basic flow system logs and uh, security logs to wherever you want to. 
So then you have doctrine filters. Um, if, you, if you do a lot with a database and you read in the doctrine documentation um, about all the doctrine features, you will figure out that doctrine supports stuff like filters, for example, and um, those are also configurable through settings, so you can write uh, really low-level doctrine filters and configure flow to use them for your application. Um, actually, we use them ourselves for the security framework, so if you use um, entity protection, entity security, um, with the new security f features from 2.0 on, um, you use a doctrine filter in a way. So that's also a nice extension point if you need to do custom stuff on the database and query level. Then you have custom database mapping types. That's also something that you probably use without knowing it, because in NEOS we use it, uh, we use it at a few points. Um, this is also a doctrine feature that we expose to you. Um, and it allows you to define um, in PHP uh, data types um, and the way they will be saved to the database. So um, if you have like a custom location type that is that has latitude and longitude, and you want to save this kind of data in, its, in some representation to the database that you feel is, is better than whatever default for doctrine is, you can write a custom mapping type and uh, use that for your data, and we provide support for that. So that's another um, planned extension point that you can use to customize the, um, the data layer, basically, of Flow. Then you have the resource handling. There's a lot to configure and change. Um, as Robert said, we have uh, cloud, uh, cloud resource support. And there again, we have a lot of adapters already. But if you need a custom adapter for any cloud solution that you, you use and there is no adapter for it, you can write your own adapters. That's obviously a planned extension point. And you can configure it and then um, let flow the, uh, save your resources to this um, custom cloud provider. And finally, you can write own authentication providers. Um, we provide a few authentication providers, but if you want to authenticate users that log into your application against any other source of uh, security, you can do that with a custom authentication provider, which is, again, obviously a planned extension point. Uh, you implement this provider, configure it, and um, your users can log in from that. Uh, example would be a Twitter authentication provider or a LDAP authentication provider. There are lots of options, obviously. So that's uh, already a lot to do. Um, and this is, uh, you don't have to read it, obviously, but this is the full flow settings YAML uh, with all its settings. And uh, the interesting part here is um, you can see the color blocks, basically. And the green blocks are just um, um, comments in the, the YAML file. So you see a lot of the YAML file is actually uh, commenting about the um, settings that come below. So if you want to understand all the settings, just look at the file. It's really well documented. Um, there is uh, no need to, to think, oh, I don't know if there's a setting or what it does. Uh, just check the file. Um, it's all in there. It's, it's very well structured and documented. Uh, and should give you good hints where to, to go, where to change stuff, and where to extend, um, extend stuff. So um, that was already quite low level. We went into HTTP and the framework itself. Now we go even deeper and change stuff in the framework. So uh, signal slots is uh, the very first thing, which is a planned extension point and also a very easy extension point. Uh, you can use both sides, basically. So a signal is something you send, um, and then you have a slot that listens to a specific signal. Um, you can send signals in your application to whoever is listening to them. Um, that is pretty easy. You basically implement this kind of method. Uh, you don't need to implement any, any actual uh, co code in there. You just implement the method and call it in some place in your code, and at that point, the signal is, uh, is emitted, and all the slots that listen to it can, uh, can do stuff. You can transfer um, information with this, with this signal, so it's very handy to, to give information about changes or, or things that happen in the application to the outside world. Um, so basically, with that, you can provide, again, planned extension points for other people that want to uh, interact with your code. 
but also the Flow Core and Neos Core provide a lot of signals that you can listen to. Um, you can check. There's, there's uh, lots of examples and documentation about it. And um, there are quite some signals, especially in NEOS for all the, uh, the node changes that happen. There are signals for that. So if you need this information for your application, um, you can build a slot and uh, get the information if something changes in, in your nodes. So that's, um, that's a way for you to basically build an observer pattern. Um, then you can do um, interface implementations. That's also a planned extension points. Everywhere in the core where we provide an interface for class, um, and this is an API uh, annotated interface, we expect or at least uh, plan for, the, for you to exchange this interface or the implementation of the interface for something more sophisticated, something that fits your application better than what we provide you. So those interface implementations can be easily changed um, via objects YAML, and I'll come to that in a second. So basically, you, you imp implement the interface in the way you like it and uh, can just replace it. And everywhere this interface is, is injected, in our code, in your code, in third-party code, um, everywhere the new implementation that you provide will be used. And here, again, uh, the point about the loading order of packages is very important because, obviously, there can be just one implementation of an interface that is used everywhere. So uh, if you want to make sure that your, your implementation is the one that is used, um, you need to, to observe the loading order and be the last one, basically, that sets the interface implementation. Um, you can modify the object configuration of any objects in the framework. And this is also a planned extension point. You might have seen an objects YAML file where you can configure that. And this is also the place where you configure a custom interface implementation. Um, just as the, the custom interface implementation is really a very planned extension point that is exactly um, in that way to be used. In the objects configuration, you can do a lot of stuff, some of which is planned, some of which is maybe not planned. But um, you can, for example, um, configure or exchange factories for specific classes or objects. Um, so if you are unhappy with the way that whatever is created, um, you can provide another factory for that and create it in a different way. Um, that's definitely a planned extension point. Um, you can change injections. Um, that is also something you can do in the objects YAML, but this is something that is an unplanned uh, um, extension point. And if I say change injections, I talked about changing injections for interfaces a minute ago. This is not what I mean. Uh, you can actually change a specific class that is injected into another class by objects YAML. That's totally unplanned, of course. And it will just happen at a specific point where you configure it. So just make sure that uh, if you do this, you, you first change all places where the class is injected. Otherwise, you use two different implementations at different places that might happen to have uh, very strange effects. And um, second, you, uh, you risk all the time that this, this breaks during an update because uh, those classes don't follow an interface usually. So uh, if you change something in the internal implementation, this, this might, might break a lot. But it is a way to change stuff that you cannot change in any other way. Um, so and then you have finally the big thing that changes everything. So if you're unhappy until now, the way you can extend stuff and you can change stuff, you have one last, one last escape uh, if you still are unable to change what you need to change, and this is aspect-oriented programming. It's an unplanned extension, uh, extension point, even though we provide aspect-oriented programming in the core and in the framework, um, because we want you to be able to hack stuff. But at the same time, we cannot, we cannot uh, foresee whatever you do with aspect-oriented programming. So it's definitely an unplanned extension point, and you need to take care that it doesn't break on an update. And with aspect-oriented programming, you can do quite a lot, even though it's pretty easy to do. Um, 
To understand the concept is maybe not that easy, but to implement it is really easy with the, with the tools we provide. But you can inject interfaces into classes that previously didn't have interfaces. So um, you have a logger class from a third party package and you want it to implement our logging interface, you can do that via AOP. Suddenly, this class somehow magically implements this interface. Um, that would be one way to, to, to use AOP. You can add properties to classes. Um, you can add all kinds of properties, uh, properties that are injections and all kinds of stuff. Um, if you need a class to have an additional property that it didn't have before, you can do that via, via AOP. Then finally, you can modify methods. Uh, that means you can change the, basically the whole method if you want to. You can, you can um, intercept the, the call of the method and, and change the input uh, arguments and then let the normal method run. You can change the input and the output of the method. Basically, you can do all kinds of stuff. Whatever you need um, to change on a, on a method that exists somewhere in the code, you can do this via AOP. Uh, obviously, very dangerous. You need to know what you're doing, but um, it's an extension point that you can use as a last escape route if you definitely need to change something and there's no other way um, to change that. And upcoming in the next version is that you can um, inject traits into classes that previously didn't have it. So. Um, that makes it very easy to add a lot of functionality that is encapsulated um, and allows you to, to be really add stuff to existing classes that you might not have control over. So that's really, again, a very powerful tool uh, that brings a lot of responsibility to you as a developer, obviously. So that's already quite a lot to extend, very low-level stuff, but this is really the, the way that allows you to do all the things you need and gives you all the flexibility in a Flow and Nails project. So there you go, your low-level extension points all explained. Uh, I hope you can use some of them at some point. And now we come to the nicer parts, the high-level stuff, the Nails part, and that is Sebastian's. Right, so very important is everything what Christian just said will work on the upper levels as well, right? So because everything is built upon Flow, which is, for instance, the content repository, which we'll look at next, or the rendering engine, or I don't know, the media module, you can always change these things using the features we've already seen. So that's very important uh, for you um, just to, uh, to recognize. So, but let's focus now on the more high-level things which the user will actually see, which the user will actually um, directly, um, well, will be visible to him. So we'll focus on the content repository. So just as a quick recap, what is the content repository? The content repository stores our, the whole contents of your website in what we call a, no, a node tree. So it's basically a really, really big tree of nodes. So if we take a website like this one, then we can uh, identify a few uh, nodes on that. So we have these four, for instance, which are aligned in two columns. And so that means the node tree for the website looks something like this. We have the main page, which, we, which is called support. Then we have two areas, which we call content collections, the main part and the sidebar. And then we have the different content elements below that. And if we take uh, the support page, for instance, there's one very important concept to understand when you think about uh, um, the content repository, and that is the concept of a node type. Because um, a node type essentially um, specifies all the properties the node is supposed to have. It specifies what can be underneath this, underneath this node. Um, so um, it is basically what a class is in classical PHP programming, but um, it is way more flexible for content because it can be adjusted and adopted in a lot of different ways. Uh, for instance, um, Oh, and, and you might wonder, if you say, OK, every content is stored in a tree, um, you might wonder, well, aren't there use cases which you cannot fit on the tree? So for instance, let's say we have um, um, products, and these products should be tagged in some way. Um, then you might wonder, how do I put that in the tree? That sounds strange. Um, so that's why important um, that the content repository provides you with what we call a node references. So that means it's like um, we have the tree with all the data, and in between are like small connections, um, 
which is node references from one node to the other. And you can use that to build tagging, to build um, all kinds of, of good user interactions for your users, and to adequately store the domain of, of your content in NEOS. The node types themselves are stored in YAML configuration, and they are, I think, the biggest planned extension point in NEOS. It's probably the one you will use in all your projects. And if you do that, um, then you'll see in this project, for instance, there exists a node type for kite, or for board, or for product, um, or for a part of a product, for instance, um, which didn't exist in NEOS beforehand. So that is a, um, if you use that extension point, it has a lot of influence on NEOS, you know, because um, um, you can not just add pages to the system anymore, but different types. And depending on the type, the content is rendered differently. And depending on the type, you can set different options in the inspector on the right side. So that is an extremely um, flexible content element and an extremely flexible extension point. And there's one special um, node type to say, which is a plugin. Um, basically, um, um, content doesn't live on its own. It is just content, you know, it doesn't have any, fu any functionality um, behind it. But there are parts of the website where you need this interactive functionality, for instance, where you need a sign-up form, where you need um, a login, or other kinds of things, a search, for instance. And um, to do that, um, you can always write a plugin, which is essentially a small flow application, you know, with the MVC stack, which we've talked about before, but just packed inside NEARS and packed into a specific part of your website. So that means um, if content uh, doesn't fit your domain at some point, you can always write a plugin as, you have, uh, as is possible in many other systems as well. But interestingly, you don't really often need to write these plugins anymore with NEOS because you can do so much with content. So that means in other systems, for instance, you would have a plugins for news, for instance. You would have plugins for blog posts, for products, for article listings, as an example, for tagging. These are all features which you can directly build with nodes where you don't have to write any line of PHP code. The only part where you need that to actually write PHP code is when the user of your website should add something, should um, provide some content, um, where there's some kind of interactivity, for instance. So that is basically the main part where you need that. But it's a lot uh, less compared to other systems. Um, so for instance, uh, this website, you know, uh, this is some kind of hotel booking website, and then you can check, okay, which dates you want, for instance, and then some logic has to happen, pull in some backend service, um, and this is all part of a plugin. Just a small side note, um, the nodes we've been talking about are implemented as PHP classes internally, and it's just one class, which we call, obviously, node, um, but uh, you can replace them. That is a, a very unplanned extension point and also a pretty dangerous one, so um, because it essentially allows you to modify how the content repository stores content on a very, very, very low level, but it's also very powerful. So that is one you will probably never use, but that's one we are using to experiment a lot with how the content repository should behave in the future. So that is our way of um, uh, extending NEOS just to, to experiment and play around with new concepts, basically. So that is uh, one of the most important extension points for that area. And we also have um, uh, a, th a thing we call node migrations. So if you evolve your content over time and you do a bigger relaunch of your website, it might be that the content um, didn't, um, the content structure changes in some way, new properties are added, or you have to move around some parts of the content. And for that, we provide what we call node migrations as well. OK, now we've been talking about how um, content um, is actually stored in the system and what you can do to extend that. Of course, um, usually you don't just want to store the content somewhere, but you also want to output it in some way, and that's where the rendering engine comes into play. Um, with rendering engine, we mean basically everything in NEOS which you use for rendering, which is um, TypoScript, which is EEL, which is Flow Query, and also which is Fluid, uh, which we've come across already. And TypoScript is uh, the sole purpose of TypoScript basically is to extend NEOS. So the only reason why it exists is to allow you to very flexibly configure the rendering of your website. But um, 
tomorrow there will be a whole talk about TypoScript and TypoScript best practices, so I'm not going to focus on this part here, um, because we'll see all the patterns inside TypoScript tomorrow. But just as a small intro, basically, um, we always have this escape hatch, because also a TypoScript object is backed by a PHP class in the end, and you are able to, extend, uh, to exchange that if you want that. So that's, again, you know, if everything else doesn't work, you can always just write PHP, and that's the way you can make it work. So that is basically the general principle we are applying on many, many problems. Same thing, um, one part of TypoScript is what we call eel. It's an expression language um, you've probably used if you used the uh, uh, Elasticsearch or Simple Search package already, which looks like that, um, or which can look like that. And this is essentially just a call of PHP methods, so it's very easy to write your own helpers there to, again, from the TypeScript world, get to the PHP world extremely easily. Right, and then there is the Neos user interface, which sits on top of Content Repository, Rendering Engine, and uh, the Media Module. And you can extend the user interface in many ways already, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, if we look at the user interface we know already, um, there are basically um, three parts or four parts to really extend the system. The most obvious one is that you can change how the content area in the middle of the user interface looks like, as this is co completely controlled by your template. So that is one extremely important extension point, so to speak, because you can, it can make fe feel nails like your website. The second most important extension point is the inspector on the right side, which allows you to edit any, any property which is not directly on the vis visible on the website. So for instance, when is this page going to be published? When should it be hidden again? Um, these kind of things. What is the author of the website, for instance, um, of the article? So that is an, ex an important extension point, which you automatically configure by, uh, by providing the right node type definitions, as you've probably been doing in projects if you've been doing Neos project before already. Then we have the, um, the language selector on top, and uh, languages are also an important concept of Neos. Basically, um, we are using um, a more general concept than languages in Neos, which we call content dimensions. And um, they are like languages on steroids in some way. Um, but it's just important if you configure them, then of course uh, the Neos UI will adapt automatically, and uh, you can you can and the editors can choose the languages they want to use. And last but not least, um, there is uh, what we call the, the edit and preview modes. And that is actually a feature I've seen in a few Neos projects to be used, but I think it can be used in a lot of more ways uh, still. Um, basically, the idea is that in today's world, we all have all kinds of different devices, devices we want to publish to. We have uh, mobile phones, we have iPads, we have uh, desktop applications, we have, I don't know, big screens, uh, you name it. And you want to target, or you want to look, uh, you want to see how your content might look like on these devices, on these output platforms, and um, edit and preview modes allow you to render your content in the Neos user interface in many different ways, and they can, for instance, allow, uh, provide you some raw content mode, which uh, which can help you to f just focus on the content, but you can also very easily create your own um, edit and preview modes, for instance, for a responsive preview of your content. And that is something um, which I think can help the editor a lot to ante anticipate how the editing um, might, or how, how, how he can edit his content so that he can target um, the devices he wants to, or he needs for his audience to reach, for instance. So that is something uh, very important, I think, that these uh, edit and preview modes are configurable and you can completely exchange how the rendering looks like in the different modes. Right, um, if you're in your templates, um, there are some problems in Neos you might have come across. For instance, if you use a very JavaScript-heavy site, a very long one-pager, for instance, with lots and lots and lots of JavaScript, you might encounter that the JavaScript at, from time to time interacts with the Neos backend, which is, of course, not the way which is, which is planned to be, but which happens currently because we render the Neos user interface and the content in the middle just in the same frame. So it just happens automatically, and currently we cannot do anything about that. Um, that's something we have on the list, um, so that uh, will change in, I guess, the next one or two years. Uh, we have some really specific ideas on that, but that's uh, something for later. So that means uh, if you're in Neos, you will probably uh, 
don't want to load your JavaScript or you want to load some specific JavaScript only, for instance. Um, and that's why we provide you some helpers um, which you can use in Fluid. Um, the most prominent one being um, used in the condition where you can say, okay, if I'm in the backend, then I want to output this part of the content. If not, then I don't. So that means for the live website, this part is not rendered for the front end, it is, uh, for, the, for the back end it is. And it allows you basically to customize your editing experience uh, towards the user in an extremely simple way. Right. If you look at the inspector, on the other hand, um, we have the different properties. The properties are backed by what we call an editor, um, which is some JavaScript code. So for instance, here we have an editor uh, for a selection where you can choose multiple elements. And the cool thing is that these, um, uh, sometimes you just have static properties. You just have a list of 10 items or five items, for instance. But from time to time, you want to load that from the back end as well. And um, what we provide you with that is an interface on PHP, which we call a data source. And it's pretty easy to implement, actually. Um, it's just one method um, which you can call, or which is called by the framework automatically, where you provide what should be shown in the selection, basically. So that means, um, for instance, if you have a, a product uh, ERP system where your products come from and you want to select the products in NEOS in, in the front end and choose them so that they can be rendered, then you can use a custom uh, data source for that. Um, you can also use custom editors. Which we have already, um, which is basically a very deep way to integrate into Neos. Um, that, um, for instance, you can use an external link editor if you need that, or all kind of other things. But of course, that involves uh, knowledge of JavaScript and especially of Ember because they are written in Ember uh, JavaScript code currently. Although that might change, like in the longer run. Now we are switching to React. That will change at some point. Right. Then um, there are all kinds of, of events you can hook into, what we call backend events, like if a page is switching, if a page is disable, uh, visible, or if the content changes. So you can adapt your content or your, um, to, to the backend experience as well. And of course, you can write um, custom backend modules. So that is also something which I've seen in many projects already used and which makes sense. Um, so that means it's, again, a small flow application and then basically just wrapped inside the Neos backend. So that's basically really how simple it is. Um, and you can use it uh, for all kinds of custom um, configurations or settings or code. So this is some configuration for products, a very complex product scheme, basically. And this is what, uh, what you can configure in the backend. Don't wonder about these gray boxes. It's just because they, we have to hide the stuff from the customer here. So that's why we've overlaid that. Right, um, so what we've seen um, so far actually is a very rundown through the whole NEOS stack. And I hope you didn't get lost on it. I know that it was a lot of topic, a lot of input, but I hope that you can, we were able to give you some kind of overview um, which, um, which parts of NEOS and Flow you can extend, you can use to customize NEOS to the needs of uh, your end users and to make a great edit, to make, uh, to customize NEOS for a great editing experience um, for the end user, because that is ultimately what NEOS is measured on. So thanks a lot. And I think we have still a few minutes, two minutes, three minutes for questions. I would cool. like to add one sentence that um, obviously we just wanted to show you an overview to plan the idea in your brain where you could extend stuff and especially to make you aware of the difference between planned extension points that you can rely on and unplanned extension points that you need to take care of. So uh, always keep that in mind if you do stuff and extend, uh, extend stuff if you're on the planned side or on the unplanned side. Right. <laughs> Nico, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christian, I have a question for you. You talked about AOP, which I think is a, a very interesting concept. Yes. What would be the advantage of using AOP to, uh, for example, inject some, um, some interface or some functionality into a class versus just subclassing it and injecting it via objects YAML or something like that? I mean, the, the question should be rephrased to, uh, if you can do it in a different way, don't do it via IOP. Okay. Uh, I mean, that, that's basically the answer I would give. Um, 
There, there might be even worse extension points that, that you can use, but I mean, AOP in itself is not bad, but um, it's so flexible and so open um, that you need to be very aware of the mm -hmm. drawbacks that you might run into uh, or that might happen on updates. So whenever you can pro use one of the, the planned extension points and even a few of the unplanned extension points might be easier on you in the future than uh, doing AOP a lot, yep. let's say. That was also my sort of my uh, feeling towards that because it makes things or it can make things very hard to understand. Yes. Actually, it's also something we are, it's like the lowest level extension point we are using in Flow or in Neo. So that means it's what we use to build lots of more uh, advanced extension points. So stuff like the signal slot implementation where you have this, add, uh, this annotation, this is essentially provided by AOP. So that means we use AOP internally in the framework in lots of places to make things easy for you. Um, and um, probably we will use AOP more in, inside and Flow and Neos than the end user will at the end. Thank you. More questions? We have time for one more question. Great. Okay. A very short one. Um, Christian, you were talking about the loading of the packages. Yes. How can I define it? Um, yes, so we, we are um, very much coupled with Composer, which we feel is a good way of, of taking care of dependencies of packages. And um, the idea is that if you depend on a package, you in some way or another extend it or you need it for your package, which means that your package is loaded after the packages you depend on. And um, in, in Neos 2.2, um, a new package manager is implemented that, that takes a bit better care of sorting of, of, these, uh, of these loading order. Uh, sometimes it was a bit um, undefined before and you might run into the situation that you defined it in a way that should work but it didn't. Um, that should be solved then and um, basically that's the way you require the packages you depend on that you extend in your composer JSON and then the loading, loading order should um, be in the end in some way that all the packages that you depend on are before your package and so you can overwrite anything in those packages. Yeah. It's basically just important that you use the composer JSON in your package itself and not the composer JSON on the site level, you know, on the top level of Flow and Neos, because um, that is all the dependencies you list, they are basically all unordered. You just say, this is the ones I need, and then internally every composer JSON of each package specifies the exact loading order. So that's just the thing to be aware of in that context.